today we are on the seventh day of October, and the memory of the holy martyr Sergius and Bacchus, you heard the Jafarian. We talked about them last year, so we're going to talk about a different saint today. The same day, memory of the holy martyrs Julian the priest and Caesarius the deacon, who will commemorate. You see the icon of Caesarius the deacon, who is the center of the life that we're going to count today. The memory also of the proconsul Leodios, who died in peace, and of the holy martyrs, the priests of Sebius and Felix, who were martyred, along with St. Caesarius uh, and the deacon and Julian the Presbyter. Today we also commemorate the Father John the Hermit and the 98 companions who lived in Ascesis on the island of Crete, who we, uh, at the monastery, we had that as the main service. And that is an interesting life. We'll probably talk about that next year. The memory of the Holy Venerable Sergius of Nurma of Russia. So those are our saints. Let's talk about Saint uh, Julian and Caesarea, uh, the martyrs. Let's, first of all, let's go to our timeline. We're in the uh, third century, at the end, before the, the peace that came with Constantine. We're still with the emperors who were persecuting all the Christians. So we're going to be right over here in this part of the timeline. Right, right before the first ecumenical council. It's in the end of the third century. Uh, so here we are, the life of our saint. So this is the this is the time when Emperor Claudius II ruled in Rome, 268 to 270. He was a first a, a very fierce persecutor of Christians. In fact, his mother became a Christian and he didn't have any mercy on her. And, uh, and put her to death. That's how fierce and ruthless this emperor was. At this time, a blessed man, Caesarius or Caesarius, came from Africa, Egypt probably, and he came to Terracina of Capana, which is in southern Italy. This is, our, this is where we're at. Follow me on the map so you can see little by little where... We are in the map. There you go. So here, here's Greece, and then this is Italy, south of Rome, south of Naples, in that part of the world. And so we're not far from the center of the Roman Empire where the emperor ruled. And he came to this part of the world, and he saw the repulsive <laughs> sacrifices of the pagans. And so he saw what the pagans were doing. They were doing awful things. They were sacrificing perhaps even human beings, but all kinds of other uh, uh, pagan activities. And he was repulsed by them, and he spit upon them, and he overturned the idols. And so this was obviously a death sentence in this time. Right? If you did this, you would show disrespect for the emperor and the whole, um, the whole uh, uh, choir of pagan gods that they venerated. And so he was arrested, he was imprisoned. After three days there without food or water, he was delivered to the proconsul Leondios, and the soldiers bound the hands of the athlete of Christ and made him walk before the chariot of the emperor in the, in, to show that he was a like an evil person. And the people saw this, this person being uh, led to, um, to be judged. And... When they arrived at the temple, the saint prayed, and the temple came tumbling down from its own from its foundation. So, by the prayer of the saint, the whole pagan uh, uh, temple became rubble, including crushing the high priest and others. And when the proconsul Leondio saw the miracle, he immediately fell down at the feet of our saint, and he became a Christian. He confessed Christ. This is the, this is the power of the prayer of the saints and God's providence to bring people to uh, salvation, that those who confess then have the grace of God. This is how things work. You see this again and again and again in the lives of the saints. Those who believe and trust for the point of risking their life for Christ and giving their life for Christ, then they have the grace of God and the prayers are heard. Did you want to ask something? Okay. Think about it, maybe <coughs> remember. Uh, everyone, uh, before everyone, Caesarius then baptized Leon Dios, and Julian the Presbyter came to him to have partake of the Holy Mysteries. So there was a priest there nearby, and he communed the new convert, uh, Leon Dios. 
Not sure how that happened with Fish the Pagans, but that's what it says in the life. Uh, the, the people, the pagans, were probably in disarray and in awe of the whole event. And so he was immediately baptized, and he, uh, he reposed almost immediately, according to life. So he gave his soul to God and died in peace. He was not martyred. Luxurious, who was the chief ruler of the city, he ordered both Julian and Caesarius to be seized. So this is the deacon and the priest. And tied in sacks and then cast into the sea. Immediately he said, you are dangerous to our establishment. You need to die. And they took them and they threw them into the sea. But before they did that, he said to him, You will indeed cast us into the sea, O luxurious, but you will be bitten by a snake, and with an ignoble and painful death you will lose your soul. So he was saying this. God gave him this clairvoyance to see what the future would be, precisely to bring him to repentance that he might not die that way. The Lord never desires the death of the sinner. Right? He always wants us to be saved. So even these amazing and awful words... That you, this is what will happen to you, is still that he was still free to repent, and that was why it was said. It wasn't said just to condemn, right? But obviously, there would be an example set, and people would say, "Look at the power of God," and, and hopefully, people would would be humbled. But it was also for the for the person's salvation himself. This is oftentimes we see this. God gives the saints this uh, ability to understand the future for the sake of their salvation. Nothing, nothing God does is not for the sake of our salvation. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to be with him. Everything he does ultimately serves that purpose. And so, uh, unfortunately, this took place, and the man died shortly thereafter. But he didn't. And this, the time when this happened, a few days later, the very time when he was being bit by the serpent, and he was going through this ordeal, the bodies of the saints were washed ashore, and a Christian priest named Eusebius, another man named Felix, they were sent by God to the shore by a divine vision in order to retrieve the relics of the saints. The divine providence had brought them to the shore. So they take up the relics, and at that time, Luxurious himself saw this. He saw the victory of the saints and the joy of the, of the Christians in receiving the relics, and, and then he gave up his soul. The relics of the saints were buried near the city, and the son of the baptized Leonius the proconsul. Remember Leonius, the one who was who believed and was baptized and died. Well, his son did not convert, unfortunately, did not repent. He actually became a persecutor of the Christians, captured Eusebius and Felix, the ones who had retrieved the relics, and they were martyred, and their bodies were thrown in the river as well. And then an angel came and led another presbyter. Curatos from Capua, Capia, Capia in Italy, and they retrieved the bodies and they took the holy relics and had them buried in an honorable place. So think about this a little bit. This is the life of the Christians before the end of the persecution. They went, they, they lived an ascetic life, they lived a prayer life, they were totally committed to Christ. They, they didn't have the luxury of, you know, I don't know going and playing in the park much, they didn't have the luxury of drinking all their favorite sodas. Uh, this way of life was not, not known to them. What was the way of life? One of exile from the world, of persecution, of prayer, of asceticism, uh, of having to have tremendous trust in God. But actually in that environment is when all the miracles and all the grace and all the gifts are made manifest, right? So when we have it easy and luxurious and things are, things are, there's no problems, there's no temptations, there's no persecution, there's no uh, uh, asceticism, there's no grace. In other words, there's no signs. All these signs you see here, for us in this day, we say, did that really happen? I mean, that's where the the, the thoughts go, right? Because we're we're very rationalistic. And, did that really happen? Is it really possible for that to have happened? We doubt it because we're trained to doubt anything that's not. You know, mathematically provable. That's how we live in this in this day and age. We're trained to do that. Well, guess what? We don't. It's not just because it's far from us, and not just because it seems so miraculous. But it's also because we're not seeing it in our own day, because we're living a very lax and worldly life, and so we will never see those things. Right? God gives those after a certain preparation and certain uh, uh, exile and denunciation of the way of the worldly life. 
So this is something we can take from this. We can remember that, yes, these miracles are amazing and, and even rationally hard to accept, but the life that they led is what made these things possible. And we, if we want to see the grace of God, we have to lead, lead, lead this a similar life. There was an elder on Mount Athos, Elder Emilianos, and the monks asked him, I love this story, I, I repeat it all the time because it's really important for us today. They went to him and said, Yeronda, why aren't we seeing the divine providence, the consolation given by God that we see in the lives of the saints? Why is it that we don't see that in our days, in our life? Why don't we have divine consolation? And he said, because you have human consolation. And when you have human consolation, God doesn't have to send and does not send the divine consolation. So when we have a real need, and when we, have, when we are deprived of human consolation, what does that mean, human consolation? That means we're, we're consoled by things like food or uh, other people come and take care of us, right? And in God's, God's providence, that's also salvific, right? We have people who love us and take care of us, and, and, and that mutual love is salvific. It's wonderful. But when we have that, then we're not going to see that kind of divine intervention in our life, because... It, there's, God does not come without there being a real need, right? He, he, he clearly intervened on many occasions here in this life because there was a need. That bodies were washed ashore, he sent someone to retrieve them. There was a need. They, didn't, they wouldn't have known without divine intervention that the bodies had been washed ashore to retrieve them. And in many other instances in the life shows that God intervened because there was a need, and it was, it was necessary. And that kind of uh, divine intervention will come when we don't have the human consolation. When we're not, we're not looking for human consolation. <clears throat> so those, you see the, the, the nature of the spiritual life here in this life. It teaches us a lot. If we want to have divine consolation, we have to forego human consolation. We have to, the, the ascetic says, I don't want the sweets, I don't want the food, the meat, I don't want all of that because what I want is spiritual food. You can say, well, why can't I have both? Well, because this is a way of showing your love for Christ and your faith in Christ. And that's a presupposition for us to have experience of the grace of God. That's what God... So we, we forego those things not because they're bad, but because by doing that, we open the door for divine consolation and divine help. And so hopefully this is a lesson for us all. Any questions or, or thoughts and any impressions? Mary, what do you think about this life? Tell me something. <laughs> I thought it was neat how they retrieved the relics from the lake. Mm -hmm. And then even when they were martyred, somebody else retrieved them. Just neat? In other words, made an impression on you the, the providence of God, or what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about anyone else? Yes? He had bravery. So the whole thing begins by him going and, and, and destroying the idols. That's the, how the whole life begins, and that's really instructive for us. He had tremendous faith and bravery. Go ahead. He come holy when he bowed down to the saint. Who, who became holy? I'm sorry. Say it again. No, I don't, don't worry. Go ahead. <laughs> Anybody understand what, what, huh? what did you want to say? Okay. I think it was, you're talking maybe about the, the, the priest Leondios when he was with yeah, the... Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's when he was, he was uh, illumined. Very good. Okay. All right. So the prayers of our holy martyr Leondios, the holy deacon Cesarias, including the president of Jesus Christ, our God and mercy.